so good morning all i invite you to this eighth day of the online classes being conducted for ma part 2 english third semester for the syllabus prescribed by rashtrasan tukroji maharaj nagpur university nagpur and being organized jointly by rajkumar kebal ramani kanya mahavidyalay jari patka nagpur vasantrao naik government institute of arts and social sciences nagpur and jm patel college of arts commerce and science bhandara there is uh, we have started with uh, the third optional paper that is uh, english comedies uh, since yesterday and today we will be dealing with the third unit in the morning session with the third unit of the said paper uh, that is uh, the way of the world by william congreve and uh, the resource person for the session is uh, dr gizala hashmi ma'am Uh, who is uh, working at uh, said kesari uh, kesari mal porwal college kamki and uh, ma'am has uh, more than 20 years of teaching experience she has uh, completed one uh, research project sponsored by ugc university grants commission and uh, uh, she holds the position of cdc member as an as a woman uh, as a women uh, representative in, uh, in her college madam is editor in chief of the college magazine and has organized various webinars uh, yeah. which included the those in collaboration with uh, uh, gad tlc and mhrd uh, uh, many research papers have been contributed she has uh, chapters in books and uh, perhaps one thing that ma'am hasn't mentioned here i suppose is that ma'am is now also a research guide she has uh, she is a research recognized guide for phd research so on behalf of the organizers i welcome ma'am to this session and uh, hand over the mic to her for her presentation over to you ma'am thank you so much sir for the wonderful introduction uh, a very good morning to all of you at the outset i would like to thank the conveners dr vyas ma'am dr davir ma'am dr dhone sir the coordinators kapil singhal sir panika sir and madhavi ma'am for giving me an opportunity to connect with the students today I'm honored and humbled, and I hope the students will be uh, benefited from the session. And uh, I also uh, pray to God for uh, Vas Mam's speedy recovery. I just came to know that she's infected by COVID, so get well soon, Mam. So without further ado, I uh, I'll, I'll share my screen, sir. Sir, is it visible? Yeah, ma'am. It is being shared. Slide show and beginning. Yeah. Yes, sir. So, shall we start? Yes. Shall I start? Sir? Yeah, you can start, ma'am. Okay. Okay. So, dear students, today I will be studying the way of the world, which is a bit uh, complex and twisted uh, plot in it. So, I'll try to make it. easy to you okay so this the way of the world is uh, authored by william congreve now here we shall uh, see initially a brief history of english drama so uh, what happened initially the plays they were started by this miracle uh, or mystery plays morality play then marlowe is the father of modern drama restoration drama restoration comedy the revival of the theater the portrayal of society in restoration comedy so miracle uh, or mystery plays what happened like uh, this history of english drama it dates back to the 11th century the earliest dramatic presentations in english is believed to have been the performance of a latin play in honor of saint catherine in dunstable in uh, 1110 by the time of the roman conquest a form of religious uh, drama originating from the rich uh, symbolic ceremonial of a church had already established itself in france and as a matter um, of time it uh, soon found its way uh, to england too its purpose was uh, directly didactic 
uh, and it was the work of priests who used to you uh, who used it as a means of conveying uh, the didactic or instructional messages. Okay. So the, this miracle of mystery plays like this was this form of drama was known um, as uh, what do you say didactic plays and the material for this mystery plays uh, was drawn from the Bible and this mystery plays expanded the mysteries connected with religion. So these are the miracle or mystery plays. Then the morality play, morality, morality plays like this was the next stage in the history of English drama. And uh, this, like the miracle play, was also didactic in purpose, but its characters, instead of being taken from the Bible or from the legend of the saints, were personified abstractions. Okay, all kinds of mental and moral qualities appeared on the stage as characters in the play, like uh, the perseverance, free will, and five senses, the seven deadly sins, good and bad angels, etc., were used, like they were held a prominent position in the miracle plays. Then we come to Marlowe. Uh, Marlowe, he created the modern English drama. Uh, he was a man of fiery uh, imagination and immense uh, past. He lived a wild bohemian life, actually. Then uh, while still young, he was skilled in drunken fight, but his uh, uh, plays like the Tamberlin the Great, Dr. Faustus, the Jew of Malta, Edward II, uh, despite their bombast and extravagance, uh, they fix the type of tragedy and chronicle play for his immediate successor. And uh, he was the first one to use the blank verse in his plays with great success. Now we come to restoration drama and restoration comedy. This time period uh, applied to restor uh, restoration drama is usually the period between 1660 uh, to 1700. But uh, the period extends a little more than that. William Congreve was born 10 years after the said period of restoration. He staged the way of the world when he was 30 years of age. And by the time, and uh, what happened by the time, uh, some of the most notorious features of the period had either ceased to exist or existed only in weaker form. Uh, the restoration drama grew out of the reaction against the Puritanism of Cromwell and the period of Commonwealth. Uh, here what happened, the theater at the time depended, uh, depended heavily on the support of nobles and the other opulent persons. Okay, very often the theme of the play reflected the activities of the court and the tests. Roles of the many characters in the comedy was based on the well-known figures of the court. There were many episodes and scandals that were also staged. Then the revival of the theater. The Puritan uh, revolution had closed the theater house in 1642 uh, because uh, there was great deal of immorality and debauchery shown there. For 14 years, no regular dramatic performance was given except in private or in the fear of the law. Then by the beginning of 1663, new plays began to march into the stage and they are the plays of restoration comedy that are characterized by wit, liveliness and immorality too. The plots of such plays were usually wanting but the dialogue is brilliant, the action lively, and the characters were the fine ladies and gentlemen of the day. Then, uh, now, we'll have a brief introduction of William Congreve. William Congreve, like 1670, 1729, like, was born in Yorkshire, England, and he worked as an officer in the army and the commander of a garrison near Cork. Uh, he was educated at Kilkenny, then at Trinity College. Uh, so he was also the younger college mate of Jonathan Swift. And then again, he went on uh, to, uh, to the college like Middle Temple in London to study law. Then uh, by 1692, Congre Congreve was already a recognized member of the literary society. And uh, his first uh, play, The Old Bachelor, was acted 
in January 1693. And then he went on to have uh, such plays like Double, The Double Dealer, Love for Love, The Morning Bride, and The Way of the World. For the rest of his life, Congreve wrote no plays because The Way of the World was not received very nicely by the audience. He was very disappointed and then he decided that he will not um, write any plays anymore. He was uh, like, this was a very frustrating experience from him. And then gradually he suffered from gout and uh, bad eyesight. And uh, in his later years, uh, Congreve conducted an ambiguous romance with uh, Henrietta, uh, Duchess of Marlborough. When uh, he died, she erected uh, a very uh, life-size uh, statue and, uh, in Westminster Abbey. And uh, then uh, this uh, rather surprising memento casts its own odd light on the Duchess, perhaps on Congreve, and certainly on the status of the male profession at the time. So these are some of the William Congreve's major works. 1693, Incognito, The Old Bachelor, The Double Dealer, The Morning Bride, The Way of the World, okay? An Impossible Thing, A Tale, A Letter from Mr. Congreve to the Viscount Cobham. Now, we'll see actually how uh, we can deal with the... What do you say? Congreve's Art. Okay, Congreve is a master of dialogue, clever, ingenious, and brilliant art style, revealing, revealing the finer uh, shades of character. He has very little to do with mechanical constructions of a plot. He puts together several episodes and sometimes they remain separate. The dialogue is the connecting link in the whole drama. Uh, the comic tone and spirit, the whole drift of the play are conveyed to us by means of dialogue. And it seems to have been particularly invented by his comic genius. Okay, so now Congress, Congreve's style. Uh, George Meredith evers that Congreve excels all his English rivals and uh, in his literary force and a succinctness of style peculiar to him. He had correct judgment, a correct ear, readiness of illustration within a narrow range in snapshots of the obvious and he was a master of copious language. He hits the mean of a fine style and natural in dialogue delivery. Okay, then the brilliance of Congreve. Congreve is the most distinct from the others and the most easily defined both from what he possessed and from what he wanted. He had by far the most wit and elegance, humor and character. His style is inimitable and though uh, perfect, it is the highest model of comic dialogue. Every sentence is replete with sense and satire conveyed in the most polished and pointed terms. Now, understanding the way of the world. So, way of the world, what happened? Uh, like, it got a very cool reception. It was not very well received by the audience. So, Congreve's masterpiece, The Way of the World, which was produced in 1700, it was uh, actually written to please its author's uh, fastidious taste, not to conform to the prevailing fashion of the age. Okay, the way of the world didn't favor with the audience. And um, it is said, uh, like uh, the famous uh, critic John Dennis states, that it was hissed by barbarous fools. And uh, the drama's test was so intense. William Congreve was so frustrated, so angry by this thing that uh, he's said to have lectured his audience from the stage itself. Okay. Then uh, this, the way of the world, it has a naughty opening. Uh, it is difficult to understand and remember each and every relation uh, with other characters on stage 
as the relationship is often intricate, confusing, and baffling. There are too many characters, and the opening scene actually uh, doesn't reveal a lot about them. Then a complex plot, as just like I said before, it has a very complex plot uh, without much action. So uh, actually it was uh, Congreve's purpose to design some characters which should appear ridiculous, uh, not so much through a natural folly as through an affected wit, a wit which at the same time is also false. So uh, actually what is the worth of the play? Uh, the Way of the World is certainly the finest comedy of the period. Its uh, felicitous uh, phrasing and polished wit give an air of sophistication perfectly in tune with the movies depicted. Now, uh, a damaging picture of uh, com contemporary life. So he, what Congreve has done is he has um, made all the characters with highly, which are highly foolish and they have uh, very, like they're weak characters. Okay, they are not strong characters who have a stand of their own, a say of their own. Then the distinct voices of the characters. The style in the way of world is beautifully varied and the voices are all perfectly distinct. Each character has a distinctive mode of a speech and rhythm and choice of language. Okay, then uh, this play is also very expressive and musical. Uh, Congreve's language, as we have, is, uh, we have said before, is brilliant and it is brilliantly expressive and beautifully musical. Okay, now wit and satire. The way of the world contains some of the most brilliant conversation in English literature and some of the most devastating wit. Okay. Uh, so, Congreve's special note of drawl satire is hardly perfectly uh, shown in the scene between Lady Wishfort and her maid, Foible, when they are talking, uh, when Lady Wishfort is standing before a mirror and uh, talking about her uh, would be youth. Then, uh, memorable features of the play. Uh, what we can say here is all the principal characters make their appearance in the opening act itself except Melament and Lady Wishfort. But we are able to gather some of the essential facts about them uh, in the first act itself. Uh, then uh, this play, The Way of the World, is uh, full of mirthful comedy. We can find a bit of like, uh, it's a um, comedy between the characters when they converse with each other. And there are some situations which show uh, the like uh, the laughable moments in it. The setting, the setting of the way of the world. Uh, setting is not varied and features a public house, a chocolate house, uh, a park, St. James Park and Lady Fishford's house. So uh, what happens is uh, act one, like it is uh, in a public place, a fashionable chocolate house. And then act two is set in uh, St. James Park. And all the um, third, fourth, and fifth acts are um, in Lady Wishford's house itself. So uh, what happens? Uh, it has a very complex plot with complex twists and turns. And uh, the setting is not varied as such. So uh, this limited setting, it uh, serves to provide a flat background against which the complex plot uh, is turned out with all its twists and turns, turns out to be merely uh, very baffling, very confusing. Okay, then the major characters here. So uh, it is the Mirabel, the protagonist, who is madly in love with Milamin. And Millament, our heroine, uh, she's a very young, charming lady in love and loved by Mirabel. And she's the ward of Lady Wishford because uh, she's the niece of Lady Wishford's long dead husband. Uh, Fenol, he's a man about town. He and Mirabel knew each other well. So as people do not move in the same circles. However, they do not really like each other. Fenol married his wife for her money. Mrs. Uh, Fenol. 
Mrs. Fennell, wife of Fennell and daughter of Lady Wishford, like uh, she was a wealthy young widow when she married Fennell. She is Millamond's cousin and was Mirabel's mistress. And uh, Mrs. Marwood, she is uh, Fennell's mistress. Uh, it does appear, however, that she was perhaps still in love with Mirabel, though. Then young Whitwood, he is a fop, and he came to London from the country to study law but apparently found the life of the fashionable man about town more pleasant. And then petulant, he also is a young fop, a friend of Whitwood's. His name is indicative of his character. Then Lady Wishford, uh, she is uh, again Wishford. She wishes for a lot many better things of youth. A uh, vain woman, 55 years old, who still has uh, pretensions of beauty. She's mother of uh, Mrs. Fennell and the guardian of Millament. Then Sir Wilful Whitwood, the elder brother of young Whitwood. He is 40 years and is uh, planning the grand tour of Europe that was usually made by young men to complete their education. And uh, then wait well, he is Mirabel's valet. At the beginning of the play, he has just been married to Poibel, Lady Wishford's uh, maid. He masquerades as Sir Roland Mirabel's non-existence uncle and woos Lady Wishford. Then this is Foible. Uh, she is uh, Lady Wishford's maid married to Whitwell. Mincing is Millamond's maid. Peg, a maid in Lady Wishford's house. Now this play, like uh, it had a, a dedication. Uh, in this ded dedication, as in most others of the period, uh, we may ignore the fulsome praise of the man to whom it was addressed. That praise is a convention of the time. Uh, some of the comments made in the letter, however, are of interest. Congreve was obviously uh, chagrined at the uh, play's lukewarm uh, reception and attributed it to the coarse taste of the audience. So uh, it uh, ridiculed him so much. He was so much upset by this. Uh, lukewarm, uh, what do you say, reception, that he never wrote another play after that. He gave up writing the plays. Now, prologue to the, prologue to the, what do you say, the way of the world. The prologue was a, a conventional requirement for all plays. This one was delivered at, by the 65-year-old Betterton, the grand old man of the restoration stage. Congreve did not keep the promises he made in his prologue. Okay, he swears he will not resent one hist of um, scene, nor like those peevish wits his play maintain, who to assert their sense, your taste, errand. Uh, the dedicatory letter indicates that he did not arrange the taste of his audience because it did not approve his play although his scenes were not hissed, okay? And uh, his statement about what is in his play has more value, some plot, some new thought, some humor too, but no farce. Uh, the absence of which he adds, ironically, would presumably, uh, presumably be a fault. The statements that there is no satire because the town is so reformed and that there are surely, surely no knaves or fools in his audience are, of course, ironic. Then now, summary uh, of each play, like each act. Uh, we'll first, I'll give you the summary of the act, and then we'll also make an analysis of the same. Okay, now what happens? The curtain rises as Mirabel uh, is... Uh, defeated by Fennol in a desultory card game at the chocolate house. The conversation reveals that uh, Mirabel is in love with Millamant, but is intensely disliked by Millamant's guardian. Uh, Lady Wishford's dislike seems to have some justification. Mirabel at one time pretended to court her in order to conceal his love for her niece. She is 55 years old and her vanity was offended when she discovered that Mirabel did not love her. Uh, when Fennol leaves for a moment, 
the servant a servant enters and informs mirabel that his valet married that day mirabel is pleased because his marriage is a necessary prelude to some secret scheme which is not revealed as such uh, which would at petulant then enter and we gain the additional information that witwood's elder brother is coming to town to court milament witwood and petulant are also both courting milament but only because she is currently the reigning belle there is a uh, further talk of an uh, uncle of uh, mirabel's who is coming to court lady wishford the men leave for a walk in the park so this is the summary of the act 1 now if we look at the analysis of this act 1 uh, see the summary of this act it points uh, up one of the difficulties in the structure of the play the first act does not does not seem to move forward it contains only partial exposition so that the reader reader has trouble following the play it is uh, like right from the be beginning it is very uh, complex and confusing the relations uh, between mirabel and fenol are not made clear it would be the actor's task to suggest the strain between them uh, the skilled and we might say suspicious reader may glean as much for, from the lines uh, fenol uh, he distressed uh, mirabel with a good cause he suspects the nature of the friendship between mirabel and his wife before their marriage he also suspects that is mistress mrs marwood loves mirabel mirabel uh, is aware of fenol's suspicions and of course suspects that mrs marwood is fenol's mistress when mirabel says that for the discovery this for this amor i am indebted to your friend or your friend's wife mrs marwood the actor will put on emphasis or your wife's friend so as to suggest that the innocent com comment is bark uh, in this uh, act 1 uh, like the lines to be uh, uh, like they, they demand to be read carefully the talk about lady wishfort is not merely casual she is very important in the subsequent action the comments about milament's character are highly important despite uh, mirabel's uh, wit and irony we must realize his sincerity the speech uh, beginning i like her with all my faults is highly ironic yet thoroughly convincing admission of love and then these two characters witwood and petulant are a pair of fops and false wits that abound abounded in restoration um, comedy uh, restoration london or at least in restoration drama uh, they have no part in the action of the way of the world uh, at most they serve uh, to suggest milament's train of suitors and uh, uh, petulant comes closer to the kind of characters one observes in the plays of johnson the foppishness of both characters can be reinforced by the arts of the uh, by the actors okay so this was the summary and analysis of act 1 now going to the summary and analysis of act 2 uh, we see that in uh, st james park mrs uh, fenner and mrs uh, marwood discuss their favorite subjects uh, men and how to manipulate them okay beneath uh, their apparent friendliness they are wary of each other as they talk to mirabel the talk of mirabel and uh, mrs uh, fenol suspects quite correctly that um, mrs marwood is in love with him now after uh, fenol and uh, mirabel enter uh, mirabel and mrs fenol stroll off and leave fenol and mrs uh, marwood uh, um, she's left alone on the stage now here uh, we discover that mrs um, marwood is fenol's mistress and that he only married his wife for her fortune uh, so as to finance his amour uh, however uh, what happens is uh, their uh, love in includes neither faith nor trust fenol is sensitive to the fact that mrs marwood's 
seeming enmity of Mirabel covers her attraction for him. Here, the scene ends with mutual uh, recrimination and reconciliation as they leave the stage when Mirabel and Mrs. Fenol return. Okay, now uh, what happens? The conversations of uh, Mirabel and Mrs. Fenol, they supply new revelations. Mirabel and Mrs. Fenol were lovers. She married Fenol as a cover for her affair with Mirabel. Mirabel, during the stroll, has told her of a scheming to trick uh, uh, Lady Wishford and uh, marry Milamet. As he does not uh, trust Waitwell, he arranged for a marriage between Waitwell and Foible. So uh, now what happens? Here, Milamet makes her first entrance and uh, on the stage, she is accompanied by Whitwood and her maid Mincing. She is thoroughly aware of her own charm and her powers over Mirabel and toys with Mirabel's love at the same time that she returns it. She is apparently quite uh, prepared to go along with Mirabel's plot, that is like which Foible has revealed to her, a clear indication that in the end she intends to have Mirabel. So after her exit, Waitwell and Foible appear. Waitwell will woo uh, Lady Wishford in the guise of Sir Roland, Mirabel's imaginary uncle. As uh, Sir Roland, he would be a fine match. Uh, in addition, the marriage would serve Lady Wishford as a way to be revenged on Mirabel for his earlier slight. So all exit with Mirabel making uh, <coughs> typical restoration comments. Okay, so this was the act two. Now, if we analyze this act, we can see this act, the tensions between the characters are exposed. Just as uh, Fenol and Mirabel, presumably, uh, presumably they are friends uh, and uh, they're engaged in a verbal duel that hid a real one. So Mrs. Fenol and Mrs. Marwood now fence. There is a good reason for Mrs. Fennell and Mrs. Marwood not to trust each other. It is true that uh, Mar Mrs. Marwood is the mistress of Mrs. Fennell's husband. By the same <coughs> token, she is also in love with Mirabel, uh, Mrs. Fennell's former and perhaps present lover. So um, the love should include trust does not occur to Mr. Fennell at all. The scenes uh, between Mrs. Marwood and Mrs. Fennell and bet between Mrs. Marwood and Fennell. See, Mrs. Marwood and Mrs. Fennell and Mrs. Marwood and Fennell. Okay, uh, they present a real uh, challenge to the actors. Before the audience is given the information that uh, uh, makes it possible to follow the play, uh, the actors must convey the currents of feeling essentially uh, cynical and unpleasant, which uh, underlie the very, uh, what do you say, polished uh, manners uh, and high style uh, of the extensions of wit. Uh, this act includes important uh, revelations of the characters. A clue to the character of Mirabel is presented when uh, Mrs. Marwood accuses Mirabel of being proud. Fenol uh, here describes himself as having uh, like what in inverted commas, a uh, heart of proof and uh, something of the constitution to bustle through the ways of wedlock and this world. So we can see, we can translate that this man, he can adjust to any circumstances and uh, his suspicions of others are accurate because he recognizes his own faults in them. And uh, Milament, is a contrast to all others about her. She is surrounded by intrigue and uh, together with her fortune, she is the object and the potential prize of much of it. Uh, however, uh, she is not herself active in any intrigue. Like her banter and uh, her weight are usually good natured and direct. She uh, does not have the cynical opinion of human nature, which is so important uh, of the attitude of everyone else in the play. Uh, she delights in teasing Mirabel 
with the justification that she thinks of him as already uh, her property. She knows that the end of the play, she is going to get married to him. And uh, she's vain, but amused at her own vanity. And uh, she can play the game of it and make jokes uh, about pinning up her hair with letters written in poetry and prose. And of course, would be completely unacceptable. And uh, she is the type which had been presented on the restoration stage. And she is without question the most successful of her kind. But in this act, you also see that the love story of Mirabel and Lemon differs from what might be accepted, uh, expected actually. Most uh, love loss, the male has to overcome the unwillingness, dislike, or some letters of the other party. But in here, in the way of the world, all the problems connected with the love of the are external. Uh, uh, there were any feeling that these two uh, are not enough. Lemon postures, frames, and teases. It is fun to be desired and be desired. But these lovers have no internal or So now, summary analysis of Act 3. Uh, at her uh, home, now, the first act was in the chocolate house. The second uh, act was played in St. James Park. And uh, now, the third act is in Lady Wishford's house. So at her home, Lady Wishford is uh, trying to hide the signs of age with cosmetics applied externally and taking brandy internally. Uh, Mrs. Marwood enters and uh, tells her that Foible was taking to was talking to uh, Mirabel in the park. While uh, Mrs. Marwood hides in a closet, Lady Wishford taxes Foible with disloyalty. However, Foible takes advantage of this opportunity to forward Mirabel's plot. She says she, he stopped her only to insult Lady Wishford, who therefore determines to accept Sir Roland, Roland due to arrive that day. Unfortunately, after Lady Wishford leaves, what happens? Uh, Mrs. Fennels enters and she and Fibel discuss Mirabel's scheme. And uh, Mir Mrs. Mirabel, uh, Marwood, uh, she's still hidden over here there conversation. Uh, they also mention that Mrs. Um, Fenol and Mirabel's mistress at one time and that Mrs. Marwood uh, is in love with Mirabel but he finds her unattractive. Now Mrs. Uh, Marwood is very angry and uh, her anger is reinforced in the next, next scene when uh, Milamet also accuses her of loving Mirabel and makes biting remarks about her age. Now, what happens when the guests arrive for dinner? Uh, petulant and young Whitwood, and then Sir uh, Wilful Whitwood, the elder brother and Milamin's uh, suitor, appear. Uh, in this scene, that perhaps comes closer to a farce than any other in the play, because Sir Wilful does not recognize his foppish brother. And young Whitwood refuses to recognize his country bumpkin elder brother. Okay. Then uh, afterwards, Mrs. Marwood, left alone with Fenol, describes Mirabel's plot. He is certain now that he has been a cuckold and wants revenge. Okay. Now, uh, Mrs. Marwood then outlines a plan for Fenol. Since Lady Wishford has control of Milamin's fortune, and since she's very fond, fond of her daughter, Mrs. Fenol, he can insist that Milamin's money uh, be made over to him uh, as a threat of making public his wife's transgressions. So this is Act 3. So if we analyze this act, we can see that uh, Lady Wishford is a stock character of restoration drama. And... Uh, this older woman is eager to entrap her husband uh, 
and it has always been a figure of fun for her. But that is not to say that she has no, uh, what do you say, individuality. In the last uh, three acts, Congreve devotes more attention to her character development and gives her more lines than any other character. She is eager to be wooed, but uh, would not seem to pursue. Mm. She uh, would be forward, but not too forward. Uh, she's, uh, she dare not smile or frown, for the paint might crack. She is heavily painted to make herself look young. And uh, she is concerned about appearances. Uh, and we can see that she is a sort of um, hypocrite. And uh, Lady Wishford, we can see, uh, is in every way worth watching. She is uh, obnoxious, laughable, a bit vulgar, a little um, disgusting, and sometimes oddly pathetic. Okay. She uh, craves for friends, but with amazing consistency, she invariably puts her trust in uh, people who betray her. Okay. And Foible, here we see uh, the comedy um, ladies made, represented perhaps by Mincing. She is an allegedly agile young woman and knows all the intrigues in the Wishfort household. She is aware of the passages um, between Margot and Fenol and the passages before that between Mrs. Fenol and Mirabel. She is indeed the key to all the matters. Foibles uh, that Mrs. Margot has a month's mind with all its insulting connotations is a key phrase in the development of the play. So Mrs. Uh, here uh, in the scene between young uh, Whitwood and Sir Wilful, some of the incidental values of the play are made clear. Uh, Whitwood's witticisms are after all uh, clever and sometimes they are apropos to it. Up to the scene, the fact that he has, uh, as Mirabel uh, says in Act 1, some few scraps of other folks' wit has to be brought out by the actor in his portrayal of the character. However, his treatment of his brother is not that of the restoration gentleman who might deplore Sir Wilful's cuteness but would never try to deny his brother. We have seen that he refuses to recognize his brother when the guests arrive for dinner. And uh, we see that Sir Wilful is a stock of a restoration comedy, uh, country comedy. He displays a common sense and foresight honesty that makes him appear for the worthier of the the last scene here between Margot and Fenol indicates clearly the direction of the play for the two following acts. The contrast opposed to the plot of the hero here is now set up. Now, some analysis of Act Four. So we see here now. There's the uh, after uh, Lady Wishford is seen uh, preparing for the visit of Sir Roland, Milamet and Sir Wilful are on stage together. Okay, so Sir Wilful, somewhat drunk but very shy, uh, here he is too bashful actually to complete his proposal to Milamet. So, what happens here? Overawed by the aloof lady, uh, Sir Roland. He is eager to get away and grateful when she dismisses him. Uh, it is uh, obvious that he will not succeed, but he is uh, likable in his embarrassment. Then what happens? Uh, immediately uh, after occurs the scene between uh, Milament and Mirabel. Uh, this is often called as a proviso scene. Proviso, uh, like um, this is a term of law which says that you can discuss the conditions uh, like of the marriage and uh, Milamant has some conditions which she uh, tells Mirabel with it. Then uh, they discuss the conditions under which he is prepared to marry her. 
and under, under which she's prepared to accept him. Now, at the end of the scene, when uh, Mrs. Fenor enters, Milamant admits that she does love him violently. As Mirabel leaves the company, Sir Wilful, Young Whitwood, and Petulant come in for dinner. They are all drunk, and Sir Wilful is the drunkest of the three. Now, what happens? This spurious uh, Sir Roland uh, arrives to woo Lady Wishford, and his wooing bids fair to be successful when a letter is brought from Mrs. Marwood, in which she tells Lady Wishford of the plot. So Sir Roland's thing is exposed here. However, Waitwell and Foible between them managed to convince Lady Wishford that the letter is actually sent by Mirabel and is designed as a plot against Sir Roland. Apparently, Lady Wishford is convinced at least for the moment. So if we analyze this act four, we see that uh, much of the act four is uh, devoted to variations on the theme of courtship in the restoration manner. Uh, first, uh, the comic country square is uh, portrayed at the end of the act, the obviously uh, drunken Sir Roland woos Lady Wishford in a broadly comic manner. Between the two comes a proviso scene. The proviso uh, scene in the way of the world is generally considered the finest in restoration comedy. The motif was first used by Dryden uh, in Secret Love. The scene must be read carefully and uh, in a performance must be developed by the actors with some finesse. Under the polished phrases, we see, uh, and the verbal fencing which goes on, the happy couple, that is that uh, happy couple, they are very much in love and Milament admits it at the end of the scene. Then we also see that the proviso scene is an emblem of the restoration comic convention. And at no time do the characters descend to any ob obvious, you know, what do you say, uh, display of uh, emotion, let alone the pathos. Uh, even though both are madly in love, they conduct a scene with complete decorum. In the restoration convention, uh, in every exchange between a man and a woman, each is trying to build his or own his or her own ego. All encounters of this, uh, all encounters of this type are uh, usually like the duels and uh, to be bested in the game of wits is to lose. So the proviso scene is the reconciliation uh, of these seeming irreconcilables. Okay. So Mirabel will be a husband, Milament will be wife, but they have made a victory of their own mutual surrender, surrender to their seemingless love. The comic uh, scene between Sir Roland and uh, uh, this one, Lady Wishford is very broad. Sir Ro Roland is a masquerade. He is the servant pretending to be a gentleman. And uh, Lady Wishford she plays the uh, salacious widow to the hilt. And inevitably, the scene is a marked contrast to the love duel of the Proviso scene. Okay, so this is the complete summary and the analysis of Act 4. Now, coming to the conclusion um, of the Act, like that is Act 5. So here we see the scene as before, again, it is Lady Wishford's house. As I foresaid, all the scenes from like third, fourth, and fifth, they have uh, they are taken place in Lady Wishford's house itself. And uh, Lady Wishford has discovered Mirabel's plot, that also we know. And Foible tries unsuccessfully to make excuses for herself. Fenon now makes his demands. So as uh, Milamant's fortune of 6,000 pounds was presumably forfeit when she married to marry a suitor 
selected for her by Lady Wishford. He wants the money as his prize for not blackening his wife's reputation. He also uh, wants the remainder of Mrs. Uh, Fennell's fortune uh, turned over to his sole control. And uh, he also insists on Lady Wishford's not marrying again so that he can be the sole heir. Uh, These terms are uh, very harsh and Lady Wishford might not be prepared to go along with them except um, that Mrs. Marwood standing by, she goads her by harping on the public disgrace of her daughter, Mrs. Fennell. So when uh, the two maids now reveal that Fennell in his turn has been unfaithful to his wife, he refuses to be deterred. Uh, he is willing to be the subject of scandal himself, but he will still make public his wife's shame. And uh, when uh, Milamet states that she is prepared to marry Sir Wilful, thus uh, meeting the wishes of her aunt and saving 6,000 pounds, Fenol suspects a trick, but he can still demand control of the balance of his wife's estate and now also the control of Lady Wishford. At this point, uh, what happens? Uh, Mirabel, he presents the evidence which will protect Mrs. Fenol. At the time of her marriage, they had judged Fenol's character correctly. And uh, Mrs. Fenol secretly signed over her fortune to Mirabel's control. So now this is a great twist in the play. And there is therefore no money which uh, Fenol can successfully obtain. In great anger, now uh, Fenol and Mrs. Margood leave the stage, vowing, uh, vowing dire uh, vengeance. So Lady Wishford, having discovered that Fenol was a villain and that Mrs. Margood, her friend, was not a true friend, is now prepared to forgive Mirabel. Uh, Millament now can marry him with her aunt's consent. And uh, it is on this happy but somewhat indeterminate note that the play ends. Okay, so we have a happy ending here. So the analysis of the act five, like it goes like this uh, fifth act is a bit muddled. Okay, uh, there is far too much plotting and action. Fenol comes in uh, with his demands. Mirabel and Sir Wilful Woodwood enter to frustrate part of them. Foible and Mincing disclose the information that Fenol and Mrs. Marwood have also been uh, guilty of adultery. Uh, for the first time, we hear of the deed uh, Mrs. Fenol signed. And uh, finally, Lady Wishford forgives everyone. So, um, here, if one looks at it uh, structurally, it is possible to see that Mirabel's original scheme is here balanced by the counterplot of Ms., uh, this one, Fenol and Mrs. Marwood. They in turn are foiled by foible and mincing on the one hand and by Millamant's presumed willingness to marry Sir Wilful on the other. But we see uh, what happens is uh, these developments are then um, countered by Fennell's insistence on the balance of Mrs. Fennell's or balance of Mrs. Fennell's money. And this mu uh, move is conclusively countered by Mirabes producing the deed signed before Mrs. Fennell's marriage. And uh, this is sort of a uh, anticipation of Fennell's greediness and she did it to protect herself if such a situation would arise. And uh, Lady Wishfort in this act, however, becomes um, almost a sympathetic uh, character. Her faults and her vanities are many. But here we see her trying to protect her daughter, finding that people whom she trusted have proven completely treacherous. Caught on the one hand by desire to save those whom she loves and trapped by the treachery of those she trusted, she is an odd figure in a very unusual sense, uh, situation in restoration drama. 
the ending of the play is not entirely uh, satisfactory. Uh, for one thing, one is finally left with the question, what of Mrs. Fennell? She will retain her money, but her lover is lost to her and it is not entirely clear that Fennell and Mrs. Marwood will not find some rather unpleasant revenge because the play has ended with a happy note and there is no revenge uh, dictated there. Then uh, we come to the epilogue. So, spoken by Mrs. Bresgerdel, who played Milament, the epilogue only makes conventional points the essential inadequacy of critics who decry plays uh, without knowledge and the statement that the characters are fictitious and no individual is represented. Uh, the satire is universal. So, poets of do in one piece expose whole bellies assemblies of pockets and blocks. So now, dear students, we come uh, to the character analysis. So the major characters. So Mirabel is the first one, who is the protagonist. So Mirabel, we see, uh, he is the ideal uh, restoration uh, person, Bio, and a combination of the cynical and the gracious. He has the vices and virtues of his kind. In his day, he has been a successful woman chaser. So as a cover for an affair, uh, Mirabel, what he does, he cynically arranged for the marriage of his mistress to a man, presumably his friend. So uh, and what he did, he also um, flattered Lady Wishford, for whom he feels contemptuous amusement. He uh, devises a plot that would blackmail Lady Wishford into consenting to her ward's marriage. But uh, even after all this uh, his scheming and planning, we see this the character is made acceptable even from the point of view of a generation that disapproves. Mirabel handles the situation with dignity and the style of his period. The irony in his comments on other uh, yeah, I'm sorry. So the irony, uh, what happens uh, in his uh, comments on other people reveals his common sense. Uh, his judgment of uh, phenol is ruthless, but it is clear eyed. Then we also see that uh, his comments on young Whitwood are uh, very shrewd and accurate. And it is worth observing that he directs uh, little irony against Sir Wilful Whitwood. And on the other hand, his ironic uh, self-criticism leads him to realize that he is indeed in love with Milament. In the play, uh, we are most interested in Mirabel as a lover. He never loses his control despite provocation in his affair with Milament. He laughs at himself, but his speech indicates the depth of his feelings. He accepts Milaman's mischievous uh, mistreatment with some resentment, but uh, uh, he still manages to remain the polished courtier. Even though he loves her, he does not lose sight of the importance of her money. His love must be seen with the context of the play. Neither he nor Milaman can sink into any sentimental act or mood. The depth and sincerity of the emotion must be conveyed by the manner, which is a necessary part of the ideal gentleman. He is in love, but he is still the completely accomplished gallant. Now we come to the heroine of the play, Milament. Milament is generally considered to be the most charming heroine in restoration comedy. She is a fitting partner, a perfect antagonist to Mirabel. She maintains uh, the same control to the very end of the proviso scene. She too loves but shows no sentiment. She is airy, teasing, light, beautiful, tantalizing and infuriating. Uh, Mirabel is aware of her faults and comes to love them. So uh, we also see that uh, Mira Milament is affected, coy and arc, but we would have no other way. She can be sweet and charming, 
but there can be um, acid and irony in her wit. Milamit, uh, what happens? He appears uh, significantly, uh, significantly in five scenes. And her first appearance, her dialogue with Mrs. Marwood, her son uh, scene with Sir Wilful, the proviso scene with Mirabel, and the drunken scene immediately following. The first and fourth are the most important for revealing her character. Milaban's first appearance is prepared very carefully when she arrives uh, trailing her coat, mincing and young uh, Whitwood. She automatically takes the center of the stage as if it is her right, as indeed it is. Her character is outlined in the passage about putting up one's hair. Prose would never do only poetry, uh, a piece of flippancy in which mincing immediately abets her. So we see that uh, the, she's completely sure of her uh, fem feminine powers and Congreve has given her the lines to justify her assurance. She knows her power and can laugh at herself just as she can tease Mirabel. Uh, within the limited world where she operates, she is intelligent. And uh, we can see that uh, she sees through the forced false wit of young Whitwood, uh, young Whitwood's humor and held, handles him very gracefully and efficiently. Then above all, Millament's character is Millament in love. She and Mirabel are worthy partners. She too will not admit her love for him for to do so would give up one's position of vantage in the game. Okay, so this is uh, here in Milament. Now, Fenol. Uh, in two uh, speeches, Fenol is characterized by himself and by Mirabel. Fenol describes himself in our terms as an opportunist, a man who can veer with the winds of circumstances. Mirabel describes himself as uh, a man on the fringes of respectability, a man who is almost acceptable. Uh, to these two complementary uh, descriptions, we must add another quality that Fenol's intense suspicion. He is very suspicious of nature and he distrusts his mistress uh, as naturally as he breathes. He distrusts everything Mirabel says and he also assumes that Mirabel is lying and uh, he looks at the snide implications of his words and tries to do justice there. Uh, the one uh, disreputable uh, dis the one uh, disreputable act we can say we can uh, attribute to him is before the play starts in his marriage. The fact that he married for money can hardly be held against him in his society. But to marry for money to finance a lover's affair is most difficult to accept. Yet it is hard to see that his part in marrying the rich widow is worse than Mirabel's in arranging for the marriage of his mistress to his friend so as to protect her from scandal should she become pregnant uh, through his, the lover's attentions. Uh, we, then finally we can see that when Fenol's suspicions about his wife are confirmed, he moves from a kind of generalized unpleasantness to quite specific action. Once his plans are made, he proceeds ruthlessly. And we have seen that throughout in the play. Then uh, Mrs. Marwood. Mrs. Uh, Marwood's character is not very carefully drawn. The mistress of Fenol, she loves Mirabel. Hypocrisy is a necessary part of the way of the world for everyone, but it is uh, the most significant characteristic of Mrs. Marwood. Uh, we first meet Mrs. Marwood talking to Mrs. Fenol. Both uh, women speak hypocritically. Both are engaged in delicate maneuvers designed to gain information but to reveal none. Both are suspicious of nature. Okay. And uh, Mrs. Mark Wood is hypocritical in her relation with Fenol. She can pretend to be um, wholeheartedly un and unreservedly in love with him, while actually she's disguising her feelings for Mirabel. 
uh, not with complete success though. Uh, and uh, but what you see is Mrs. Marwood's essential hypocrisy and villainy show up most clearly in her relations with Lady Wishford. Here, what she says, she uh, feigns a friendship. She tries to spoil Mirabel's plan as confidant and advisor. She tries to get Lady Wishford to accede to Fennel's demands. There is short, no one on the stage with whom our uh, relations are not based on an important lie. So she's a hypocritic and hypocrite and a big liar. Now we come to Lady Wishford. Lady Wishford is a character type with a long tradition in drama, the overeager man-seeking widow. Her first offense and that which initially makes her an object of ridicule is the breach of test for she should know better. Uh, she is first described by uh, Mirabel, who points out that her uh, character is defined by the tag name Wish and Fort. Wish Fort. And she is 55 years uh, of age, an age that certainly seemed um, very old to the precocious and brilliant 30 year old whose play was being produced. Uh, she is also the character with most lines in the final acts of the play. So we see that Lady Wishford's vanity is made clear from the very first we see her. She misinterpreted Mirabel's flattery, which she describes in the first act. In the third act, the picture of Lady Wishford at her toilet ridicules the woman who does not accept the fact of her age gracefully. Her indecorous interest in men as part of her character and important uh, for the action. It is the reason she can, uh, we can say that uh, she misinterprets Mirabel and the reason Mirabel can uh, hope that she'll be married to Milamen, he'll be married to Milamen one day. Uh, the one uh, disreputable act that can be seen is she considers himself as young and stands in front of a mirror and examines her beauty. Uh, as a woman who controls considerable wealth, she is accustomed to having her own way. Uh, she is abrupt and tyrannical with her maid. Her, she plans her ward's marriage. Uh, it is clear she does not like to be crossed and does not expect to be. Uh, Congreve has proved this character further. Her vanity and man chasing both have a common source. She lives in a world of fantasy. Like I've said before, uh, she keeps looking into the mirrors constantly, but does not see what everyone else sees. In her mind, she can still be a little girl of 16 or a beautiful young woman. She's therefore especially susceptible to flattery, but there is no touch of good sense to help her see through it. And uh, we can see that uh, because of her susceptibility to flattery, uh, her friends are always ill chosen uh, and in her uh, dilemma in the last act she is left bewildered and helpless uh, she is a sort of complex creation of congreve uh, the butt of author's satire and actor's ridicule yet the object of some kind of painful sympathy okay now sir willful whitwood the uh, yeah, what do you say, the elder brother of young Whitwood. He is the country bumpkin as the butt of the city wit, is a traditional character type in comedy. Like other characters in the play, Sir Wilful does not quite conform to type. He is shown as having country manners. He drinks too heavily, he is very shy, and he is overawed by the uh, ladies of the city. And uh, he is... Uh, justifiably angry in his encounter with his brother. His attitude in other matter, matters suggests a sensible person, but certainly does not wish to marry Millament if she does not choose. Okay, then young Whitwood, uh, he had uh, also come to London uh, from the country to study law. 
and he took to London uh, life enthusiastically, but not always wisely. He thinks of himself as uh, very witty and intelligent, but uh, his judgment is not sound. He serves as a, as a contrast to Mirabel, his uh, default picture, the affectation of the restoration ideal. So what Mirabel says about him, that he is a fool with good memory and some few scraps of other folks wit. Petulant is best characterized by his name. Obviously, as young Whitwood uh, is excessively good-natured, not even recognizing an insult, Petulant is ill-natured, too eager to prove himself by ill manners. And he too, like young Whitwood, is a pretender to status. He is a liar uh, and a poser. He is an uh, interesting specimen in what he talks of having a humor. But uh, we see that the sure sign that is affecting the humor, although it may by long use have come to me to be by Congreve's distinction, a certain habit of his. Then wait well, he's the valet, he's very clever and uh, he has some wit uh, of some accomplishment, he's married, knighted and attended all in one day. And as uh, Sir Roland, he performs well, but must perform as a bullets of the gentleman. It is uh, one of the conventions of the drama of the time that the servant will try uh, to model himself on his master. He is therefore by an awkward imitation of Mirabel, only ready can be taken by him. Foible uh, is obviously a very intelligent young woman and like all servants, she is uh, presumably eager to play the go-between and uh, we can see that her loyalty is only for herself and she's not clearly trustworthy. And uh, mincing, uh, a pale attempt to copy her mistress and she can second Milaman's statement that is impossible to put up one's hair in prose. So Mrs. Fenol, Mrs. Fenol has some important functions in the play. She is the mainspring uh, in Fenol's counter plot. When she's made of Mirabel's plot, she talks too freely with Foible and is overheard. She helps uh, fill out the gallery of portraits and uh, she's not a very well-drawn character, but perhaps uh, it is easier to see why Mirabel tired of her then, why he ever loved her in the first place. Okay. Now, the themes in the way of the world. So the first thing is love a la mode. So certainly we can see here, the play can be seen as a dramatic uh, representation uh, of varieties of love in the England of the year 1700. Central is the delicate handling of the love game as played by Mirabel and Milament. They represent the ideal of the restoration attitude, intense yet balanced. Their love based on mutual esteem with no surrender of individuality. Contrasted with it are Mirabel's earlier and quite ambiguous love affair with Mrs. Fenol, the illicit love of Fenol and Mrs. Marwood, presumably passionate but wholly without mutual trust. The curious quote young Whitwood plays to Millamant, the direct and somewhat coarse approach of Sir Wilful and the opposite extreme completely, the aging and undignified longings of a lady wish for. Then love and money. Such an approach is closely related to that of love a la mode, although they are not identical. In the world whose way is presented here, love and money are values to be taken into account at all times. The sincerity of Mirabel's love does not make him lose sight of the importance of Milaman's fortune. So he is equally in love with Milament uh, and also her money. Fennel marries for money to support an illicit love. Apparently, the thought of marrying Miss, uh, Mrs. Marwood without educate money is unthinkable. Money is also always in Lady Wishford's mind and even the marriage of the servants is built on the promise of handsome sum of money. 
So love without money is an impossible sentimental dream. Although money often corrupts what love there is. Then a gallery of portraits. We have seen a lots of characters. So Congreve statements in the dedication, the prologue and the epilogue suggest that this might be a valid subtitle. Since it is the way of the world to put a premium on youth, Mirabel and Milamin stand at the center, uh, representing all that is to be commended. So Mirabel is polished, poised, rational and balanced, witty and uh, over intellectual. So Milamin is the belly, feminine, beautiful, witty, not prudish, but with a sense of her own worth. She has avoided the messiness and humiliation of sexual intrigue. Opposed to Mirabel are would-be wits, worthy but graceless boors and deep intriguers. So every ca character reveals himself in action and together they produce a gallery of self-portraits. Now, Jungle of High Intrigue, this subtitle would focus attention on some of the values of uh, London society. Here, everyone is engaged in intrigue. Mirabel intrigues to gain consent to his marriage from Lady Wishford. And this involves intrigue within intrigue, for he does not trust Waitwell. Fennol intrigues in turn. Everyone is involved in one or the other of the schemes. Mrs. Fennol, Mrs. Marwood, and the servants also. Even uh, Lady Wishford, in her willingness to marry Sir Ronald, has a devious purpose. That is revenge on Mirabel. When Mrs. Fennol married her husband, that was part of an intrigue, as was his marriage to her. And as we see in the play, Victory goes to Mirabel not because of his virtue, but simply because he's the most successful in Chigua. So, the way of the world, we can see now the further points for consideration. Uh, the love expressed in the play tends to be centered on material rather than the love of the partner. They are more uh, behind the money. Uh, the more, um, what do you say, financial uh, material gains rather than the love of a person. Women's uh, subjugation to their husbands under both law and custom at the time and an attempt to improve the position of wife underlie a scene where Milamin states her terms for a prenuptial agreement with Mirabel. So then we can also see that none of the characters in the play can really be seen as good and such it is difficult to find a hero or heroine or indeed anybody whom one would find deserving of sympathy or good behavior, action and temperament. So we all know that uh, what the way of the world was played uh, in the theaters. So these are the person dramatis. These are the people who played the roles of the characters in the play. So thank you so much and uh, I hope you students have understood it. So over to you, sir. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. Ma'am uh, started with uh, a very, uh, what I should say, a uh, statement that every teacher should make regarding uh, the complexity of plot. And uh, she promised to students to make it simple. And that is how a teaching should be. We have to make it as simple as possible for the students. So uh, starting with that statement, ma'am gave us a brief description, uh, a brief introduction to the uh, history of English drama and uh, even a uh, background to William Congreve, a biographical note was there and uh, his major works along with uh, his art and style, they too were commented upon and then uh, the uh, different relations that we have in uh, uh, in the play, uh, the way of the world, the relation among the characters and the setting of the play uh, with this background. Ma'am uh, went ahead on uh, the sum and summarized the, the play act wise uh, to give you uh, to give you to tell you the story and uh, along after that, uh, the art of characterization, which is an important, important aspect of all the dramas uh, that was dealt with. And uh, Mem also told us about the major themes which are there in, uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this play. So uh, overall, I think uh, that is enough, that is sufficient material for the students to prepare for their examination. So 
थैंक यू मैम फॉर योर वंडरफुल प्रेजेंटेशन एंड ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ द ऑर्गेनाइजिंग कॉलेजेस आई अप्रिशिएट योर प्रेजेंस हियर ऑन दिस मॉर्निंग ऑन आर रिक्वेस्ट एंड होप द सेम काइंड ऑफ कॉपरेशन फ्रॉम यू इन द इन द फ्यूचर एज वेल सो थैंक्स वंस अगेन मैम एंड आई डिक्लेयर यू सर for my pleasure it was an honor to be with the students and thank you for giving me this opportunity yeah. thank yeah, you so most much. welcome ma'am yeah and we, yeah we have to, yeah uh, and as i've already told you that we ex um, expect the same cooperation from you in the future as well ma'am surely sir surely that will yeah. be an honor again <laughs> thank you so much so okay the session for the day is over we'll be meet meeting in the evening now for the fourth unit of uh, this paper